Molecular orbital, orbital theory started in the 1930s with the work of Mulliken and Hund, and this work was uh, recognized to be very important. Uh, the, it received the Nobel Prize. But it wasn't until the 1950s and the early 60s, with the work of Kenichi Fukui in Japan and Roald Hoffman here at Cornell, that uh, molecular orbital theory became a powerful tool for practicing chemists. Um, this will be my final story about my encounters with great scientists for the course. Uh, here's a picture of Dr. Hoffman. Uh, Professor Hoffman's office is actually the one closest to the room where Baker, uh, Baker, uh, where, where Chem 2070 is normally taught, Baker 200. So he, he listens in to uh, what's happening in the class and he talks to me about it. Uh, and here, here is a picture of him. And uh, if to tell you my final story, uh, I have to tell you something about my own personal history. So um, 17 years ago, uh, 18 years ago, I, I got shingles. Shingles is the chicken pox virus, uh, which has gone, has, remains dormant in your nervous system. Uh, and I got over the shingles, but what I didn't know was that the, 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 the virus, uh, which is called herpes zoster, uh, continued to multiply inside uh, my body, uh, but it had actually traveled into the brain. And uh, that leads to something called uh, herpes zoster vasculitis. I hear it from time to time if you watch this TV show called House. And it's one of those weird things that can happen. But um, uh, in, in my case, uh, this is what happened. Uh, this is a, uh, an MRI uh, of, of my uh, brain uh, taken uh, right after I had a stroke uh, in early August uh, 2003. And um, there's a weird thing about MRI images, they flip it. Uh, but you, you can see that the um, my left, uh, the, this is the cerebellum, the, the one of the back lobes of the brain, um, it, it, it died completely in, in, in my stroke. I lost something like uh, 5% of the brain mass in, in my head uh, in the stroke. Professor Hoffman and another professor in the department, Frank DeSalvo, uh, also a, uh, another great scientist, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, stepped in at this point and uh, essentially saved my, my, my scientific career. A... Um, a chemistry department, a university will give you six months to recover. For a stroke where you lose 5% of your brain mass, uh, six months is, isn't going to do much. Dr. Hoffman and Dr. DeSalvo uh, then contacted the college and said that they were willing to teach my course for me so that I wouldn't have to go into early retirement. Well, I mean, from the point of view of the college of Cornell, uh, you're getting a Nobel laureate to teach an extra course. So it's a total win. So uh, they agreed. The department kicked in time. Uh, they gave me a, a nominal course teaching the uh, the guest lectures, which uh, uh, I had a year of sabbatical. Uh, I had the six months from uh, from uh, uh, the the medical leave of the stroke. So that gave me two and a half years, which is just barely enough time to recover from from a, from a large stroke. And I, I think this is a tribute to uh, the generosity of spirit of Professors Hoffman and DeSalvo and the collegiality of the Cornell community. Um, it's a great community that you've had a chance to join if you're a freshman. And finally, I'd like to say that as this is uh, a story towards uh, the end of my scientific career, uh, I hope that this will begin uh, one of the first stories for the beginning of your scientific career as you go on and encounter uh, the great scientists of, uh, of the present day and the future. So I hope that, you know, as you uh, move along, uh, you start accumulating your stories and uh, in your life journey as a scientist. Okay, so um, I ran into Professor Hoffman. I wanted to give a name to what his idea was so that it would be easier for uh, to, to describe it to Chem 2070. And I said, is it okay if I call it the Hoffman Ansatz? Ansatz is an assumption. And he said, yeah, okay, it's okay. 
which I think means that this is correct. And the idea is a very simple one. And when I say it in words, it won't sound like much, but as I give you pictures, you'll begin to see why it's so useful. Dr. Hoffman recognized that it was the apparent change in the kinetic energy based on the atomic orbitals and molecular orbitals, which corresponded to the real change in the total energy. Let me just, uh, I'll, I'll show you pictures. So it's hard to otherwise understand what he means. We'll do it first for H2. We'll, we'll develop in this clip the MO diagram for H2. We have the blue hydrogen on the left and the red hydrogen on the right in H2. Uh, they make psi 1, uh, as we saw in the last clip, uh, when they add constructively. And they make psi 2 when you take phi 1 minus phi 2. And now we're going to apply the Hoffman ansatz to figure out the energy of these two orbitals. So we want to look in the Hoffman picture at the kinetic energy. Kinetic energy depends on velocity. Velocity depends on momentum. Is momentum directly proportional or indirectly proportional to wavelength? Put it in chat. Momentum is directly or indirectly proportional to wavelength. Indirectly proportional. So we must figure out what happened to lambda. And we can get some sense of lambda from the wave function. Just looking at the wave function and looking at the d function. And so I'm going to plot in the next graph the d functions for phi 1 and phi 2. It's a 1s orbital. And I'm going to just, as a license, a drawing license, I'm going to show the d, orbit, uh, the d function tailing to the left and tailing to the right since uh, uh, the, 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 the 1s orbital extends in both directions. And so there you see the d function for 1s for the blue going left and right. So there's r in both directions. And the d function for the red phi 2 going left and right uh, r in both directions around the two origins. And the question is, uh, what happens when you add the two together? So when you add the two together, waves add. Waves literally add. And if I add the blue function to the red function, oh, uh, I, 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 I'll get to that in a second. When I add the blue function to the red function, I get the picture in purple. This is psi 1. So, uh, has the wavelength increased or decreased in psi 1, the purple psi 1? Put it in chat. Has it increased or decreased in the purple psi 1? It has. Well, it looks like it gets increased, and I'll get back to the second. Let's get to the picture on the right. The picture on the right is the d function where... Uh, phi 1 is positive, but since it's minus phi 2, I've had to switch the sign of the d function. Now let's get skip back to where we're that purple psi 1. Psi 1 is the purple one on the left. So is lambda bigger? And the next picture will help. Lambda, the that, that mountain, is just half of lambda. Lambda has increased. Well, not really the lambda. The apparent lambda has increased. This is important. It's not the real lambda. It's the lambda that we see in these pictures. So the apparent lambda has increased. That means the apparent momentum has... Put it in chat. Uh, if the apparent lambda has increased, what has happened to the apparent momentum? Well, they're inversely proportional, so it's decreased. If the apparent momentum has decreased, what has happened to the kinetic energy? It has decreased. And now, here comes the Hoffman ansatz, which is in direct contradiction to the virial principle, which is in fact correct. The apparent decrease in kinetic energy corresponds to a decrease, a real decrease in the total energy. This is the idea. And indeed, 
the constructive interference which makes it look like lambda has increased and therefore momentum has decreased corresponds to a lowering of the total energy. Now let's look at the picture on the right. Uh, the D functions. The D function for the blue is positive. The D function for the red is negative. When I add the two, do the waves cancel each other out or do they add constructively? Is it destructive or con constructive, the addition of those two? They are of opposite signs. It's destructive. When we add the two together, it looks like the picture shown in purple here. And is lambda now longer or shorter than before? Put it in chat. Is the apparent lambda longer or shorter than before? And the answer is the apparent lambda is shorter. If the apparent lambda is shorter, what's happened to the apparent momentum? The apparent momentum is bigger. What's happened to the apparent kinetic energy? The apparent kinetic energy is bigger, and therefore the true total energy is higher or lower. Put it in chat. The true total energy is higher. So, psi 1 is lower in energy because the two phi one, the blue phi one has gotten to work together with the red phi two. Well, psi two is higher in energy. And this you can just see without a detailed computer, just using the Hoffman ansatz. Let's draw the actual diagram. The MO diagram is put on an energy scale. Can you see to the left there is the energy scale. Low energy is the bottom, high energy is the top. And first we draw the blue phi 1. That's its energy. The red phi 2, is that at higher energy, lower energy, or the same energy? Well, they're both hydrogen atoms. This is before any bond is made, or anti-bond. And so it's exactly at the same energy. The 1s on a hydrogen of one atom and the 1s of a hydrogen of another atom are at the same energy. But now let's look at Psi 1, the constructive interference. According to the Hoffman ansatz, what's happened to the energy of Psi 1? Put it in chat. Put it in chat. Psi 1, the constructive interference, has increased the apparent wavelength, and therefore uh, the total energy has gone down. And so I draw it lower. And I put it in between because this is... Uh, the central region is where we put the MOs, and the outside region, the left and the right side, is where we put the original atomic orbitals. orbitals. And what's happened to Psi 2? Is Psi 2 at higher energy than Phi 1 and Phi 2, or at same energy or lower energy? Put it in chat. Psi 2 is higher in energy because the apparent wavelength has gotten shorter. So there it is. And then it is... Uh, Traditional to draw tie lines, lines connecting, showing that psi 1 and psi 2 or, uh, originated from the mixing of phi 1 and phi 2, the adding and subtracting of phi 1 and phi 2. This is the MO diagram, but it's not in the ordinary format. We don't normally draw the axes. So this is the normal drawing. Uh, can you see that I've just gotten rid of the axes, but it's exactly here. It's the same picture as before without the axes on the two nuclei. The nuclei are expressed as dots, and the line in the center is the internuclear distance between the two hydrogens. So the 1s orbitals are around the center of the dots there. And there's one more thing that is standard in the MO picture. It's to put in the actual orbital energies. Every, every orbital can take one upspin electron and one downspin electron. So in the original blue hydrogen, how many 1s electrons were there? Put it in chat. A blue 1h, this is before it made any uh, a bond or H2, just a lone hydrogen atom, has one electron in there. I've shown it there. There's its energy. And similarly, the red has one electron at the same energy, and I both put them parallel spin. 
Now, psi 1. Psi 1 can take how many electrons? Put it in chat. 2. One upspin and one downspin. So the original electrons that were at the 1s energy have lowered in energy to enter psi 1. And there's also psi 2, but there are no electrons to go into psi 2. It's higher in energy. And so two hydrogen atoms, when they get together, the electrons go down in energy. That going down in energy is the covalent bond.